Uh, we've got session three now, which is diving deeper into bronchiectasis, um, where we've got a few uh, talks. Um, the first one on Pseudomonas in sputum, uh, this, and then a video from uh, one of our, our ELF patients, um, followed by a talk on antibiotic use. Um, my name is Amelia Schumark. For anyone who missed the beginning of the conference, uh, I told you everything I know about bronchiectasis in 10 minutes. Um, I'm based at the University of Dundee, um, and after we've had the talks, we're going to have a question and answer as per the format this morning. Uh, just a quick reminder of some of the housekeeping things. Again, I think if you've got any questions to ask, please ask them in the question and answer function rather than the chat on the side. Um, and um, uh, people are, are muted and so you're unable to answer, ask questions in person. Um, I'm now going to hand over to my co-chair, Maria, uh, for her to introduce herself and the first speaker. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Maria Suarez. I'm from Lisbon in Portugal. I'm a member of the patient advisory group for uh, bronchiectasis from ELF. And uh, as Amelia said, uh, with her, we will be, we will be chairing this uh, session. Um, the first talk uh, will be by Dr. Ottenberg from the Netherlands. Um, she works as a pneumologist in the Amsterdam University Medical Center, where she's involved in the clinical care of patients with uh, many lung pathologies, such as cystic fibrosis, primary ciliary dyskinesia, bronchiectasis, and other lung infections and lung diseases, I should say. And so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Altenberg, for joining us, and I, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot, Amelia and, uh, and Maria, for this introduction. Can you all hear me? Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. and um, could my, my slides please be shared, or should I share them myself? Uh, whichever you prefer, I can share. Yeah, if you can share them, I prefer that, seeing the others struggle a little bit with the slides. Thank you. So, so far, I've really been um, enjoying the patient conference myself, and I must say that I've also picked up some quite useful practical tips, especially, that I think I will be very useful in my own, uh, in my own office with my own patients. So... Yeah, thanks again for having me here. Um, in uh, the patient conference, I will tell you something about pseudomonas. And I think that's a subject which uh, can be of interest for you all because um, once, uh, yeah, it can all affect you once when you have bronchiectasis. And I'll talk a little bit about what is pseudomonas and uh, also what it means if you have pseudomonas in bronchiectasis and then I'll go into treatment of pseudomonas referring to current treatments and future treatments for pseudomonas because I remember from the last bronchiectasis patient conference and from my own office that there's a lot of interest from patients about yeah, what's in the pipeline for treating bronchiectasis. And next slide please. So what is Pseudomonas? Pseudomonas is a bacteria. It's a gram-negative bacteria, and that refers to the properties the bacteria has when we culture it in the lab. It's uh, ubiquitous, which means that it's a bacteria that's uh, in quite, it's quite abundant all around us. And especially the bacteria can be, meet, can be met in soil, and in natural fresh water, especially when the water is still, like ponds or lakes, etc. Uh, Pseudomonas is often mentioned as a hospital bacterium as well, uh, which uh, is especially true for the intensive care units, where Pseudomonas is known to cause very hard to treat infections. But apart from the hospital, it's easy to meet a Pseudomonas when you're outdoors or handling soil or something like that. Um, the Pseudomonas is often depicted green, and that's because it has a green color when you culture it. And that's the picture that you see on the right hand side. And a lot of you who are infected with Pseudomonas 
will know the foul smell which comes from pseudomonas. And a lot of patients I have know that their pseudomonas is uh, getting stronger again because of the smell of their sputum. And I think a lot of you will, uh, will, uh, will um, recognize that. Uh, pseudomonas can cause infections of a lot of other things besides the lungs. So it's known to infect skin, uh, cause abdominal infections or urinary tract infections. But in vulnerable patients uh, or patients with vulnerable airways, for instance, bronchiectasis, it can also be an important pathogen causing lung infections. Uh, next slide, please. And if Pseudomonas wasn't such a menace, you could also you could almost feel some admiration for the way that it escapes the defense mechanisms of the body. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Oh, just a second. I have to le let in the cat because it is going to move forever. Yes. Okay. There you go. Very sorry. It's got a really bad timing, this one. Um, so uh, Pseudomonas has got a lot of defense mechanisms that um, help it escape the, has escape the cleaning mechanisms of the body. At first, uh, Pseudomonas is known for its resistance towards uh, many types of antibiotics its resistance to most oral antibiotics and it's also got different mechanisms which help it um, uh, against help it fight antibiotics so that makes it quite hard to treat and to make it even harder the resistance mechanisms can change over time and vary over time and pseudomonas can also steal resistant resistance genes from other bacteria in the neighborhood and imply it in its own genome to make it even more resistant. So antibiotic resistance can be one of the things why pseudomonas is quite hard to treat, especially with oral antibiotics. And another thing that, that, that helps pseudomonas survive within the human airways and within the human body is its ability to form biofilms. When Pseudomonas first enters the body, this will be in a free floating or planktonic state. But um, when Pseudomonas is in the body or in the airways for quite a longer period of time, it calls all its friends together and they form small groups which grow and grow and um, are covered in mucus to avoid uh, antibiotics entering the body and to avoid the natural clearing mechanisms of the airway to get rid of pseudomonas. So together they are stronger and together they can resist antibiotics, ciliary motion, etc. Next slide, please. Then pseudomonas in bronchiectasis. Um, we see that 15 to 30 percent of patients with bronchiectasis will have pseudomonas positive cultures anywhere in time and of course this percentage really varies between different countries and different regions but you can say something about which patients are at risk of acquiring th pseudomonas if you look at the studies patients fac patient factors that contribute to acquisition of pseudomonas are older age, so the older you are, uh, the most likely you are to acquire pseudomonas. Uh, this is also true for if you have very widespread bronchiectasis at CT scans, because this forms a lot of hideout places and cavities where pseudomonas can, uh, can enter the body and group. And also low lung function is a patient factor that predisposes for acquisition of pseudomonas. Um, a lot of my patients ask if there are certain things they uh, should or shouldn't do in order to avoid getting pseudomonas. And then I often tell them that I would advise against swimming in open water pools, especially when there is no, uh, no running water and the water is still. Uh, for instance, if you are in a forest in a small lake, because that's a place where Pseudomonas takes its, its hideout. And also people with occupations or certain hobbies 
which involve working with soil, pot plants, but also uh, fish and snake lovers who have aquariums or terrariums in their home could have an increased vulnerability to get pseudomonas because of the exposure of pseudomonas in such places. So generally, I would advise against such hobbies or uh, having snakes in your house also for a lot of other reasons. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, then the main question of this talk, I think, do I have to worry about my pseudomonas? And of course, if we look in the literature, there's a quite strong association between having pseudomonas and having worse lung function, progression of bronchiectasis when you look at the CT scan, having more exacerbations and a poorer quality of life. However, next slide, there is a chicken or egg question here. It's still not completely understood if it's patients with already bad lungs or low lung functions who are at risk of, acqu of acquiring pseudomonas or if it's the pseudomonas itself that accelerates the disease. Uh, I think personally that it's a bit of both. So you get pseudomonas a lot of times because you have some amount of lung damage but the pseudomonas in itself can accelerate your disease a little bit. But where it starts, no one really knows yet. Uh, next slide, please. And then the second cardinal question, I think, is do I need treatment for my pseudomonas? And I think generally speaking, you can say that if, you, if it's the first time a pseudomonas is cultured in your sputum, treatment is truly indicated. And this treatment should not be very much delayed and this treatment should be just right in order to try to get rid of the pseudomonas. And I'll tell you a little bit about that later on. In case of a chronic pseudomonas infection, um, I'm a bit more ambig ambiguous in my advice. Uh, I think if you look at the international guidelines and if you ask my opinion, my general advice would be if you, have subs if you have subsequent positive sputum cultures with pseudomonas, I would surely uh, see that as an indication for treatment. But um, I think there's something you have to define first. Uh, next slide, please. I personally find it very useful to, together with my patient in the office, decide if the pseudomonas of this person is considered a, considered a threat or a pet. And in the first case, uh, this patient would typically have uh, many exacerbations, would show a deterioration of lung function because of their pseudomonas, and would have a lot of chronic complaints such as um, cough, uh, a lot of mucus, fatigue, uh, etc. And in this case, um, treatment for chronic pseudomonas infection is surely indicated in order to try to reduce some of the symptoms and signs that the pseudomonas causes. But in other cases, there are also patients who, despite of their pseudomonas, have stable disease, no or little sputum expectoration, have stable lung function, have good quality of life, and in these cases, the treatment burden of, um, of pseudomonas, of, uh, of anti-pseudomonal treatment, may outweigh the possible advantages that treatment may bring this patient. So I think that this is really a very important concept to consider before deciding on starting treatment. Uh, next slide, please. And so how can pseudomonas best be treated? You remember we've been talking at, about the differences between a first and a chronic pseudomonas infection. And I will first talk about the first time you have pseudomonas in your sputum. So the first positive sputum culture. Um, in this case, it's quite important to treat. And this would be an eradication treatment. And with this, we mean an antibiotic treatment, 
which is given with the express intention of achieving complete clearance of the pathogen from the airway. In other words, to get the bug out completely and not only to keep it quiet. Um, which is what's important about this eradication treatment is that the time between the first positive culture and the start of treatment is not too long or actually it should be as short as possible. So don't wait too long because if you wait, it will give the pseudomonas the chance to collect all his bodies and form the cozy biofilms that we've been looking at. And once they have the biofilms, they are, it's not impossible, but it's harder to get them away. The typical treatment for uh, eradication of pseudomonas would, will either be um, an oral antibiotics or intravenous antibiotics. And I here show ciprofloxacin as uh, oral antibiotics and uh, ceftazidim as intravenous antibiotics. But of course, depending on the sensitivity or the resistance of your pseudomonas, other uh, agents will, should be found to treat it. And in most cases, your doctor will also give you some form of nebulized antibiotics together with the oral or IV, uh, because it keeps the pseudomonas away for a longer period of time. And next slide, please. Okay. Um, and then I go to the chronic pseudomonas infection. Now, as I told you, you have first have to decide together with your clinician if the infection burden or of your pseudomonas is enough to warrant chronic treatment with uh, anti pseudomonal antibiotics. For chronic pseudomonas infection, the uh, cardinal treatment will most frequ frequently be nebulized antibiotics. And as you know, they come in different forms. You have powder inhalations, you have nebulized antibiotics, and depending on the sensitivity or the resistance of the pseudomonas, your doctor will choose one of the types of, antibi of antibiotics. And of course, you can also self uh, express a preference for either powder or nebulized antibiotics when you're in need of treatment of a chronic uh, pseudomonas infection. Um, and in addition, in some cases, especially when uh, anti, anti uh, pseudomona antibiotics do not completely resolve the complaints that you have from the, from the pseudomonas, uh, azithromycin or another macrolide antibiotic might be added um, in order to try to reduce the symptom burden and the number of exacerbations because of its anti-inflammatory effect. And the goal of this treatment would not be to get the pseudomonas out because uh, more than often it does, this, this is not the case, but the goal would be to keep the pseudomonas quiet and to have it yeah, reside quietly inside your lungs and not causing you the complaints of exacerbations, sputum, etc. Next slide, please. Um, so there are uh, a lot of positive effects of inhaled antibiotics. If you look at the studies, they cause a reduction of bacterial load. Um, they um, enlarge the chance of er eradication of pseudomonas. However, the chances are not very large, as, as I just uh, told you. And in the studies, people had less exacerbations. Or, or, um, however, the difference between the non-treated groups wasn't very, uh, very large. But I think as you, the most of you might know, there are also important downsides of inhaled antibiotics. Uh, inhaled antibiotics, especially the powder antibiotics, can cause irritation or constriction of your airways, which, make you, which can make you feel very much out of breath or make you cough a lot after you've been uh, applying them. Another thing is, as we've already heard from a lot of patient stories, that uh, the application of inhaled antibiotics is very time consuming. And considering the fact that you are going to need them sometimes lifelong, this is a very important, uh, important point. And another thing is, is if you look at the studies, 
the effects on quality of life and lung function are not very sure uh, with regards to quality of life. This might be because of the high treatment burden the nebulized antibiotics have. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll now talk a little bit about the future of pseudomonas treatment because there might be some light on the horizon. I think that we just saw that the current treatments we have for, anti for pseudomonas are quite okay, but in my opinion they are not good enough. There is only about a 50% chance of eradicating your first, first pseudomonas. And we also just saw that inhaled antibiotics have important downsides, especially the amount of time that you have to take daily in order to apply antibiotics. And other import, important point is antibiotic resistance, which really limits the number of antibiotics that we can use to treat pseudomonas. Next slide. So what's new in um, the battle against pseudomonas? I think just as one of the previous speakers has said, there are always new and different antibiotics on the way. So hopefully the armamentarium that we have as clinicians will expand a little bit. But there are also two uh, more experimental and new treatment options that I'd like to, do, to uh, discuss really shortly. One's bacteriophages. I put this in on purpose because I get a lot of questions about them. And the other one is anti-pseudomonal antibodies. Next slide, please. Um, bacteriophages are actually viruses which are used to kill bacteria. You can see them here in the picture with the white arrows pointing towards the bacteriophages, which are like entering and invading the bacteria in order to kill it. Next slide. And um, hypothetically, bacteriophages could have a lot of uh, good points. For instance, they could be used in multi-drug resistant pseudomonas because, because it's a really different thing than the conventional antibiotics. Uh, they are kind of a natural treatment because it's a mechanism that the body itself also applies to fight bacteria. There are many of all of us have bacteriophages in their own body. And especially in Eastern Europe, for instance, Georgia, there's a long-standing experience with uh, bacteriophages. Next slide. But I think at the moment, uh, what really prevents me from advising for bacteriophages would be that there is a real lack of good quality clinical studies. So um, although it's um, although there's a lot of experience in Georgia and other parts of Eastern Europe, and although there are infrequent reports that it might help well, for us as scientists, it's not re it's not completely sure if it works as it should, if it's safe, and for which people we can use it. Another thing is that. Um, uh, creating the bacteriophages is a very specialized job. It's not something that every hospital or every lab can do. And bacteriophages have to be personalized. They have to be specifically made for you and cannot be applied to someone else, which makes the process quite time consuming and costly. And another thing is that even with phages, we are not rid of uh, resistance formation because pseudomonas can get resistant to phages as well. So although hypothetically it's quite um, promising, um, I would not advise it for now. But uh, personally, I keep a close eye on the developments in Eastern Europe. And hopefully there are going to be some good scientific reports in order to help us as doctors understand for which patients this treatment might be useful. Next slide. And I think another um, very uh, interesting development, which is also really in its, its early stages, is anti-pseudomonas antibodies. And these are um, um, these monoclonal antibodies are a synthetic version of the human uh, of the human body antibodies. So it's also kind of a natural type of treatment. 
And here you can see how it works. You can see them bind to their target. They attach to their target and they, uh, yeah, let's say invade the target to make it harmless. They uh, start a lot of processes which, um, um, yeah, which, which can make the pseudomonas harmless. Um, these monoclonal antibodies are, can be directed against different parts of pseudomonas, which can make it a good treatment, I think. But at the moment, it's only studied in trials. And as far as I know, at the moment, there are no, uh, it's, it's all very early, early phase work. So no, I think there are no trials now where you could participate in, but keep, we, we all have to keep our eyes open and see what's the, what the future is going to bring. Next slide. So in summary, and I'll also give you some tips, please remind that pseudomonas can be a threat or a pet. And um, which of the two is true for you? Please discuss this with your own physician. Uh, I would really advise to have yearly sputum cultures to check for the presence of pseudomonas, especially because it's so important to attack pseudomonas, your first pseudomonas in a timely manner. In case of this first pseudomonas or your first positive sputum culture, always try eradication treatment. And this can be oral, IV, plus um, uh, inhaled antibiotics. And inhaled antibiotics applied chronically with or without macrolides can be of benefit in chronic pseudomonas infection. And hopefully the future will bring new treatment possibilities and we'll try to keep you as, as informed about it as possible. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions in the uh, question and answer session afterwards or otherwise in the chat, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we will, we will do the, the session, the questions in the end, everyone together, if that's okay. We will now move to the topic of managing the exacerbations by watching a video made by Tanya. Edberg, who, who like me is a member of the uh, patient advisory group and is from Sweden. So let's just watch the video. Tanya will not uh, be answering questions live, but in the end she can she will write a reply. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tanya Hedberg and I live in Sweden. I was diagnosed with bronchiectasis when I was a teenager. I also have primary ciliary dyskinesia and I've been colonized with pseudomonas for decades. I've been treated with intravenous antibiotics about five to ten times a year ever since I was born and even more frequently these past few years. My pseudomonas are resistant to most antibiotics and my treatment options are limited. But today, I'm going to be talking to you about home IVs. My everyday life has always been about trying to juggle with airway clearance, infections, having to stay in the hospital for treatment, and also trying to live some kind of normal life. The photo illustrates this, being a child holding a Barbie in one hand and a nebulizer in the other. Now, I don't play with Barbie dolls anymore. But I'm still juggling and I'm still struggling. My everyday treatment burden is quite heavy and time consuming. And there isn't always that much time or energy left for other things. I pretty much grew up in the hospital. And as you can see, I wasn't always too happy about that. But in the late 1990s, I was finally able to start administering IVs at home, which was great. Even though it's a lot of work, and the side effects from the antibiotics are often unbearable, I still find it more relaxing to be at home. Because living with a chronic condition affects my quality of life and my self-image, and it's important to me to feel independent and capable. Well, let's talk about antibiotics. They often come in these little bubbles, or these bottle-like intermate infusers. I'm always treated with two different kinds of antibiotics at the time. For example, my most recent treatment was Abibactam and Keftacidim. I administer the IVs every eight hours for at least 14 days. 
and the infusion time depends on what antibiotic I'm treated with. Some are infused over half an hour, others an hour, and the abibactamin keftacidum mix had a two hour infusion time. The antibiotics are delivered to my home or to my local health center nearby, and they come in these cool boxes. And how often they get delivered depends on the stability of the antibiotic. For example, some are delivered every day and others maybe twice a week. And the antibiotics need to be stored in the fridge, but each bubble or bottle need to be room temperature before administering. I have a porta cat which is placed under the skin in my chest. It makes infusions in life a bit easier. This is the needle that you put into the port and it only has to be changed every seven days during its treatment cycle. And as you can see, the top is quite flat and doesn't get in the way. I can move freely and sleep freely and I really appreciate that. I was asked to briefly talk about how I administer and connect my IVs. And this is how I was instructed by a nurse. What you need is some kind of IV line the antibiotic, alcohol wipes, and syringes with NACL. First of all, hygiene is really important. The surface of the workplace has to be clean and also your hands. I use alcohol wipes to clean the cap of the IV line and I wipe for about 15 to 20 seconds and then I let it dry for about 15 seconds. And then the tube needs to be flushed with NACL, but first always check for air bubbles in the syringe, then flush. And then you just connect the IV. And that's it. When the infusion is done, then you just deconnect, scrub with alcohol wipes again and flush with NACL. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that video. So next um, on the agenda, we've got Constant um, Kawira, who, will, um, who spent time working as a clinical pharmacist, both in the UK and New Zealand. Um, she specialised in respiratory medicine during her time in New Zealand, uh, where she also served as a member of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee at Canterbury District Health Board. She's just taken up a new post as partnership manager at Medicines Discovery Catapult, which is a not-for-profit organization in the UK. We look forward to hearing your talk, Constance. Thank you very much, Anelia. Um, I am going to share my slides. Um, hopefully, if I just do that, if I change slides, is that showing up? I've just flicked, did That's it change? showing, but it's showing the view that you see. The presenters. Rather than the, rather than the presenters, yeah. Right, so it's working. Uh, no, we, we, can see, see. we can see your next slide and your notes as well. Oh, you can see my next slides and my notes. I'm just going to see if I can drag it up uh, and try and move it to a different screen and see if that'll work. Bear with me, sorry. about the logistics, I thought I had it worked out, but uh, otherwise it might be easier for me to share my slides, actually. Would that be better? Uh, Connie, hi. I think yeah. you need to stop sharing, then start uh, the viewing mode, and then start sharing again. I think okay. that would work. Do, 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 do. Sorry about that. I'm just going to see if I can drag it up to a different screen. Sorry. Stop share. Okay, let's try one more time. Uh, and is it better now? No, I cannot no. see. But okay. Sorry. Are you happy to share the slides for me on my behalf then? Uh, just, yes. And so I don't you, take up too much time. Yes, and I'll give you access to, to click so you don't have to say next slide. So you can, you can try okay, clicking great. on the screen and then maybe use the arrows uh, to switch between slides. But I'll be there. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, just let me design. Let me know when you're ready to go. OK. 
Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, so um, my name is Constance Takabuya, and uh, as has already been shared, um, I have a background in clinical hospital pharmacy. So I have experience working with people who have cystic fibrosis and people who also have bronchiectasis. Um, I hope that by the end of this talk, you will have a better understanding of antibiotic use um, in managing exacerbations of bronchiectasis. Okay, so slide change. You can't quite see the screen. Sorry, are you able to move it? Yeah, thank you. Um, so when it comes to managing um, uh, in infective exacerbations, uh, the choice of antibiotics that's normally decided by your team will be based on the bacteria that has been found in your sputum um, and what it's sensitive to, and also if you have any allergies or not. So people, for example, who might be allergic to penicillin, uh, your team would obviously avoid any penicillin-like um, antibiotic. Um, Typically, one to two antibiotics would be used. Uh, there are occasions when steroids are used, but I'm not going to talk about that um, in this talk. Uh, for many of you, um, two antibiotics have, uh, have been used, and this is usually when resistance is a concern. We've already had uh, a lot of discussion this morning um, or and this afternoon on Pseudomonas. So that tends to be a very difficult to treat uh, bacteria. Um, and in those cases where, in the cases where resistance is an issue, uh, generally speaking, your doctor will choose two antibiotics. And um, they tend to consist of antibiotics from different classes. And by that, I mean, they'll get one antibiotic plus another one that's completely unrelated. So for example, using something like keftazidine plus something else like tobramycin, which is completely unrelated. And uh, the reason behind that is because you're wanting to have a boosted effect and hopefully get on top of the infection. Um, many cases, um, antibiotic treatment lasts about 14 days. Some of you have had treatment that lasts a little bit longer than 14 days. And that might be because the infection is just a bit more difficult to treat and you need a little bit longer. There are instances where some of you might have had less than 14 days, and that might be because you've responded really well to treatment and slightly less uh, time is needed. IVs are usually given by a specific type of line. Some of you have portacaths. Tanya showed us a picture earlier of the needle of her portacath. Some of you have had something called a pick line put in, and some of you would have had a midline put in in the past when you needed IVs. Um, and uh, the, um, the IVs can be given either in hospital or at home. There are pros and cons or advantages and, and disadvantages to having it at home and advantages and disadvantages to having it in hospital. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about home IV treatment. Um, Tanya has already shared about this. Not everyone is suitable for home IV treatment. Um, the decision is usually made on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so your team will take in lots of factors into account. Um, as we've seen from Tanya, um, she uses her antibiotics three times a day. So typically most IV antibiotics are given three times a day. Um, so this is a, an added burden to the treatment for some people already. So it can be difficult for some people to manage doing home IVs at home in addition to all of their treatments like their nebulized treatments with sodium chloride, et cetera. The other thing to consider is whether you have enough storage um, space at home. So I'm sure many of you saw Tanya's video. She had um, a lot of boxes after her delivery. Um, oftentimes those medications need to go into, um, into refrigerator. So having the space to actually store the medicines is something to be considered. Um, if you're feeling very unwell and you've got sort of quite a severe exacerbation, um, many cases the team are reluctant to send you home on home IVs they might want you to get well first in hospital and then maybe think about home IVs towards the end of your treatment. Um, the next thing to consider is how close you live uh, to a nearby treatment center so if you live somewhere quite far away from uh, a nearby hospital or a clinic your team might be more reluctant to send you home on home IVs this is simply a safety mechanism because um, if you ever have any problems while you're at home with your home IV treatment, it's important that you're seen to sooner rather than later. And if you live quite far away from a, a nearby treatment center, then it can be difficult for you to be seen soon by your team. 
Um, typically, the home IV medications might be uh, administered by a, a nurse who comes into your home and gives you the IVs, or there are many instances where um, you can be trained up to do your own, your own IVs at home. Uh, so uh, the nurses would train you on how to um, attach all the different devices, or if you need to dilute any of the medications, you can uh, get some training provided on that as well. Next slide, please. Aside from um, home IV treatment being cost effective, one of the other advantages of having home IV treatment is you can continue on with activities of daily life at home. So this means that you can continue working um, if you're at work or you can continue attending school if you need to attend school. So home IV treatments often enables you to continue on with your day to day activity. Um, Hospital treatment, on the other hand, the advantage of that is you've got 24 hour help and care if and when you need it. Um, also, when you're in hospital, there are no limitations on the type of antibiotic um, that can be given. So, for example, there might be some instances where people need an antibiotic uh, that needs to be given four times a day or five times a day. That's so much easier uh, to get done in hospital than it might be at home because it's a lot more complicated when you're having to have um, IVs um, multiple times a day, like four to six times a day. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, another way to have antibiotics, which has already been touched on um, not too long ago, is they can uh, you can have um, antibiotics via the nebulized route. So examples of those would include tobramycin and colistin. Um, and as has already been spoken about, typically these might be used where you are having lots and lots of uh, chest infections. So maybe upwards of three or more chest infections a year that need IVs, and you also have pseudomonas in your chest. The, the reason for these nebulized antibiotics is to help reduce the bacterial burden that's in your lungs. Um, and hopefully the outcome of that is you've got uh, a reduced frequency of infections. So this, this is uh, one of those treatment options where you don't notice the effects uh, straight away. You will notice the long-term benefits over the course of the year because you might notice that you need less antibiotics in, in a year once you start on the nebulized antibiotics. Um, sometimes when people start these antibiotics, they might notice that they cough a little bit more or their chest gets a little bit irritated and they get chest tightness. When that happens, um, your physiotherapist or your physician can actually prescribe you a medication that helps open up your chest. Examples of that include things like salbutamol, which is a, a short acting reliever, which is often used in conditions like asthma. But what that medication does, it actually opens up your chest and reducing the chest tightness that you might get when you use nebulized medications like tobramycin and colistin. The second antibiotic that's already been discussed today, so I won't go into it too much, is azithromycin. Um, again, that's up to your physician whether they add that in or not. Um, typically, uh, azithromycin is an antibiotic, but it also has other special properties in that it also has an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, so in the, long, in the long run, it will reduce um, the, um, the consequence. So for some people who get re repeated chest infections, they also get inflammation associated with that, which affects your long-term lung function. So by reducing the inflammation with medication like azithromycin, we hopefully help preserve that lung function in the long run. Um, but whether to start azithromycin or not, that's usually up to your physician. Next slide, please. So I'll just touch briefly on allergies, intolerances, and other reactions. So some people can develop uh, allergies when they first start a new medication. Um, there are some instances where you can develop an allergy even after you've been uh, even after you've had an the same antibiotic uh, for years and years, you might suddenly develop an allergic reaction uh, to it. If that happens, make sure you report it to your team, make sure that they know what symptoms you've had. Um, also where you've had a special type of IV line put in, if you notice any pain, redness or swelling around your IV line, it's important that you report that to your team as well. Um, your team will normally assess your reaction and make a decision. Sometimes they 
might stop your antibiotic and switch to something else, or sometimes they might decide to continue and just keep an eye on things. Uh, and in other cases, they might decide to continue and prescribe you some alternative medicines to help with the uh, symptoms that you're experiencing. Next slide, please. Okay, and the last thing is was just to talk about monitoring. Um, some of you might have had blood tests when you've been on your antibiotics. Um, the blood tests really are to make sure that the antibiotics are working. Um, the blood test also helps us know if you are getting the right dose of the medication into your system. They also help us know if your body is clearing some of that medication. So this is particularly important with a medication like tobramycin, um, and what we want to do there is to make sure that your, your body is actually getting rid of all of the medication and that it's not building up to toxic levels uh, because medicines like tobramycin, when they build up to toxic levels, it can be toxic to your kidneys. Um, and plus also tobramycin can be harmful for hearing. So um, the doctors might ask you some questions just um, about your, your kidneys and also about your hearing just to make sure everything is, is, uh, is going smoothly. Um, and they will also look at the blood test just to make sure you're clearing your medication well. Um, just remember, if you have any questions or in, have any concerns about your medicine or you're worried about any allergies or reactions, it's important that you talk to your team. And that was the last of uh, my slides. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for a very clear presentation. Shall we kick off with the um, questions, Amelia? Yeah, so um, uh, I think we've uh, we've got about eight minutes for questions. Um, mm -hmm. There was a little bit of chat, Yoshi, um, in the chat for um, about um, having pseudomonas, but also having other things at the same time. So there was a question, can you have pseudomonas and can you have aspergillus? Can you have pseudomonas and MAC? And if you have more than one infection at the same time, is the sort of prioritization for treatment and things? I wonder if you could just talk around that a little bit. Yes, of course. Yeah, as I said, pseudomonas, um, is very happy to reside in lungs, which are already a little bit damaged. And this is also true for other pathogens. So it's quite common to have co-infections. For instance, pseudomonas uh, can be there together with a, a Staph aureus. We also see NTM and Aspergillus co-infections. And I think a lot of combinations are possible. And I also saw the other question that said, how do you know which one to treat? And that's actually quite a different question also for us as clinicians, because uh, it's quite hard to know if the sputum that you give up or the exacerbation that you have, is it caused by your pseudomonas, by your aspergillus, by your NTM? Of course, we can do some testing. Sometimes blood results can tell you something. But in most cases, it would be a question of just starting treatment for one thing see how it goes and the first treatment you start would be the less uh, the less long and the less toxic treatment you see how it goes and if it's not enough you treat another pathogen sometimes you can treat two at once but this is one of the hardest things i meet in um, in my consulting rooms can i can i just uh, launch another another topic that was quite a few people asking i think along the same line which is about transmission and about how you can get pneumonas. You, you briefly touched on that. But a lot of people are trying to be a bit more clear about that. So can you, how can you get it? And how is it transmissible? So can someone who is infected infect someone else? Is mm -hmm. it through droplets or aerosol? Is it just by having a pot of plants in your living room? Is it dangerous for you or do you actually have to do something to get it going? So can yeah. you have pets, pets as well? People are, are, are also asking about pets. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe I, I made everyone really scared with showing the dogs and the, <laughs> and the pet slides. But this was not my meaning, no. I'm not aware of pets transferring pseudomonas because most infections who are important in animals cannot be transferred to humans and vice versa. So I wouldn't worry about my hamster or, or whatever 
calls in pseudomonas to me uh, with respect to transferring it to other people as long as the other person has a normal immunity a normal immune system and doesn't have a, a damaged lungs you're absolutely fine and the chances of transferring it to those to those to to someone else causing a severe infection are very low however i would be really careful if you're around other people with bronchiectasis or otherwise damaged airways because uh, especially in cystic fibrosis there are reports that pseudomonas can be transferred so but you don't have to be super super um, considerate about that it's just the normal measures that actually everyone is applying since covid uh, so washing your hands if you cough don't don't cough in the direction of the person but cough in your elbow or in a, a handkerchief so if you apply the normal rules the chances of infecting someone else are not very big and, and what about swimming pools and lakes so you mentioned yeah. that st still water is a problem, and that's understandable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about uh, swimming in the lake or going kayaking or doing yeah. water-related water activities mm -hmm. in open water, let's see, or swimming yeah. pools? Yeah, I saw the kayaking question as well, and I think it's really important that if you really, it's on the one hand, it's really great to be outdoors and be exercising outdoors. So. Um, I think it's it's a it's a thing of balance balancing the risks if like i said the chances of getting pseudomonas are much higher when you have an older age and have severely damaged lungs so if you are uh, let's say over 60 or 70 and you know that you have a really low lung function and you have a very bad bronchiectasis i would really be very careful with practicing sports on uh, still water uh, outdoors However, going to uh, going to the sea or the beach is is fine. Uh, being around flowing water, like in a river, would be fine, which is uh, quite agreeable for canoeing as well, I think. So it, it's it's kind of balancing the risk. If you have really mild bronchiectasis and a good lung function, yeah, you might can take the risk of getting uh, of kayaking on a lake or something. And what about gardening? Sorry, it's just Sorry about coming up. Yeah, gardening. No, gardening. Gardening, yeah. <laughs> I already saw some lady who said, oh no, do I have to give up gardening? No, I don't think so. But here it's also a thing about balancing the risks. Because if you, uh, I would really advise against handling large quantities of soil or uh, like ground where you put the plants in, you know, you, I, I think it's not good to have it in large quantities and put it in the flower beds yourself. But like the normal uh, lighter work in the garden would be no problem. You can shuffle, you can do, but don't like emerge yourself in the pot ground and really wash your hands very well after you've been gardening. Okay, thank you. Yes, I hope it's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Amelia, do you have any other questions for Constance or Yoshi? Uh, yeah, so there were some questions in the chat, um, Constance, about storing of antibiotics and storing of medications in, in general. I don't know if you've got any advice on that. Um, so that is certainly one of the factors that gets taken into account when deciding what to send, what antibiotics to pick um, if, if someone's suitable for home IVs. So I think I saw one of the questions was specifically around colistin uh, and colistin is one of the antibiotics where as soon as it's been made up, it has to be used quite quickly. So it can't be stored, uh, for example, for a certain amount of time. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's certainly things like drugs like meropenem, for example, it tends to, once it's been diluted and mixed with water, it has to be used within a certain number of hours. Um, there are other antibiotics that are quite stable, so they're, they're able to last a lot longer um, in the fridge, so it could be upwards of three days or four days, and I think Tanya did talk about that. She said she sometimes gets deliveries every day, and that might be with, with medications where um, the stability isn't very long, which means it has to be used within 24 hours of being made up. And in others, she might get it twice a week, which means the drug is good for a lot longer. Um, so it, it, it'll vary from medication to medication. That, and that's a, a discussion to be had with the team, certainly. Thank you very much. Maria, did you have any uh, 
I have questions one more for Constance. Question. We actually have to move on very quickly. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a quick one, a very, very quick one. Someone has asked um, for the difference between using a, a mouthpiece or a mask when nebulizing. Is there any specific guidelines for that? Um, I think, I, I don't know if you've had any physiotherapists on here today, it certainly isn't my area of expertise, unfortunately, I think it, it might have to do with the type of device that they have, uh, and other infection control measures, and, and there are factors that do come into play depending on which device is best, but I'm, I'm certainly not the expert to, uh, to share okay. and offer any advice there, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I don't think there's a break between sessions. So I think we now move straight on to our next session on research in new treatments in bronchiectasis. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.